as we set up the presentation. Let me tell you just uh, a couple of words uh, about my background. Okay, so uh, as Jen was saying, I come from Italy, so uh, you will excuse my uh, Italian accent and my uh, random use of hands. Uh, I studied actually as an undergraduate in Pisa, which uh, is a place with a leaning tower uh, where people like to throw objects, and so uh, if you're in physics in Pisa, you're, you're often asked about objects falling from towers. Uh, I then, after graduating, uh, I went uh, to uh, Caltech in Southern California as a postdoctoral associate and uh, I fell in love with a beautiful American woman that I ended up marrying and uh, uh, she is also a professor in the physics department she's an astronomer um, and it's great to have an astronomer uh, for a wife and we'll show to see why uh, and we have two wonderful little kids uh, three months uh, sorry ten months and three years old Okay, so uh, tonight I will talk about part of my research and I will tell you what we think the universe is made of. So let's start from our cosmic address. Uh, that blue thing over there is the place where we sit on. And it's a little teeny rock that is part of a set of nine rocks orbiting around a star, actually eight rocks. Since, as you know, Pluto is no longer considered a planet, and in fact that is partly something that I blame on my wife, who attended the conference where it was decided that Pluto was not a planet, and it was degraded to a dwarf planet status. Uh, so that's kind of unfortunate, but that's what you get when your wife is an astronomer. So. Um, we are sitting in a pretty peripheral place in a galaxy called the Milky Way. And uh, the Milky Way is a galaxy that contains approximately 100 billion stars that look like the Sun. So this means one followed by uh, 11 zeros. That's a lot of zeros. So a lot of suns, a lot of uh, maybe Earths around, I don't know. Uh, but what I do know is that there's about a hundred billion such galaxies in the so-called observable universe, which means the universe that we get some light from. Okay, so that's a hundred billion, again, one followed by 11 zeros, galaxies like ours, and each one of these galaxies contains a hundred billion stars like the Sun. So that's really a lot of zeros, in fact, 22 total zeros of stars and possibly systems like the Earth orbiting the stars in the visible universe. Yet, what I'm claiming tonight is that that's actually a teeny detail in the overall matter and energy content of the universe. It's a teeny detail in what the universe is made of. So tonight, what I'm going to be talking about is something that is called cosmology. Okay, cosmology is, comes from the Greek, and if you go to school in Italy, you are forced by the state to learn Greek and Latin, which is almost entirely useless, uh, unless you're a Catholic, which you have to be if you're in Italy. And uh, so cosmology is a word that comes from the Greek, two Greek words, cosmos and logos. And uh, cosmos means everything, means the world, uh, and means, uh, while logos means word, literally, but also knowledge of, okay, as opposed to chaos. Logos is the opposite of chaos. And so, cosmology is, in some sense, the knowledge of the order, the order that we think inhabits the cosmos, the way we understand the cosmos. In fact, since times immemorable, we have always tried to make sense of the cosmos, of everything that surrounds us. You know, starting with the Egyptians that thought that the stars were living on this uh, good-looking woman in a weird <laughs> posture. And, uh, and then in our Western civilization, we had a much more sophisticated view where, in fact, there was something that was not a woman on top of the Earth, that was obviously flat and uh, with some underworld and pillars of Earth, etc. Today, we have a picture 
we call this picture modern cosmology that hinges upon the notion that the universe used to be in past eras much hotter and denser than it is today and it originated in some sense that we don't really understand from a big bang and it kept expanding and the way in which we understand the expansion of the universe is based on two things on observations on direct measurements that we can take of the universe as is out there for us to look at and extrapolations by extrapolations I mean we are testing the laws of physics which we believe uh, applied when the universe was very very hot and very very dense and that's something that particle physicists do and uh, my training is in particle physics so I kind of live in this part of modern cosmology my wife instead lives in this section here and so it turns out it is some of a lab and in fact we do write papers together which is interesting from a marriage standpoint uh, but anyways this is uh, what we call the standard cosmological model so what is a model in science when we talk about a model we have a very precise notion of uh, what we are talking about so a scientific model is something that you can take and make quantitative predictions out of it numbers that you can test against observation so you've got some sort of assembly of laws that are not just random statements are things that you can turn the crank and get out numbers that you can compare with observations with measurements that's what a scientific model is and the standard cosmological model is one such model for example it predicts and I don't know if uh, my graduate student back there who's drinking beer can actually make out those data points on that plot but he knows what that plot is that plot is the cosmic microwave background uh, spectrum and uh, if you could see the error bars you would see that the error bars are teeny and this line here that goes through all of these points is a prediction of the standard cosmological model which evidently works very very well this is the so-called matter power spectrum it represents how much matter there is at a given mass scale how many galaxies of the southern milky way how many clusters of galaxies how many dwarf galaxies and so on and again the red line passes beautifully through these points a prediction that is tested against observation and these are the light elements that we observe in the universe that are synthesized when the universe was very very young and again an observation and a prediction beautifully match so that's why we think that our cosmological model is not only a pretty picture uh, it is a scientific model so what are, what goes into this beautifully nicely working model well the key ingredient of the standard cosmological model is an entity called dark matter it's an entity called dark matter which as the name says is something that does not shine and it's something that literally holds galaxies like our own Milky Way together it makes the birth of structures such as the Milky Way possible it is an essential ingredient for all of the predictions that I just showed you so here let me show a picture actually a little movie that my colleague Joel Primack uh, who is at UC Santa Cruz and who was one of the uh, original uh, inventors of the dark matter paradigm uh, this is one of the highest resolution pictures of what the universe looks like if dark matter were not dark So what you're seeing here is the result of many, many million hours. Oops. Okay, sorry about that. Let's start again. Of many, many million hours of computer simulations that simulate what the universe would look like if its dominant matter component, dark matter, were visible. Okay, so each one of those bright things represents this dark matter structure that hosts galaxies like the Milky Way the big one in the center is actually a cluster of galaxies, a collection 
of hundreds to thousands of galaxies that you can imagine live in all of these bright spots. So all of these bright spots essentially play the role of creating gravitational potential wells where gas in the early universe falls and starts forming stars and then subsequently galaxies and the beautiful things that uh, we observe uh, in the universe. And this is one of the highest resolution simulations of the dark matter universe. You can carry out the exercise of pasting on top of these kind of simulations galaxies. Okay, simulate how galaxies would form in such a universe. And it is another predictions, another set of predictions to compare the result of these simulations with the actual observed universe. Okay? It is a very, very pretty picture. When, when Joel shows it, he's got his beautiful music composed by his wife, who's a musician, uh, instead of an astronomer. So here's the result. So, so evidently, it's very hard to tell apart observations and simulations. And again, these simulations are entirely based on the movie we just saw. Okay, so you paste galaxies and you simulate what you would observe and you compare with observation and uh, you know, it's really hard to tell them apart. However, there's more to the universe than matter, than things that behave under gravity in the way that a chair behaves. And this thing was discovered in 1999, so just at the turn of the century, and it's called dark energy. In fact, dark energy exists because the Nobel Prize was given for dark energy in 2011. It clearly proves that dark energy is sound and proof. Uh, so there's no, you know, weird things going on. It's Nobel Prize stuff that I'm talking about. And these are the three guys that got the big pot of money. Actually, Saul Permuter, who is a colleague at UC Berkeley, got half of the pie. As you might or might not know, the Nobel Prize, when it's split in three, somebody, so the lucky guy, gets half of the pie, and then the other two split the other half. And so in this case, it's this Australian guy and this Johns Hopkins young fellow who uh, split the 25% uh, of the pie. So they discovered the existence of dark energy, uh, and they had many scientific discussions. Uh, they were running these two concurrent uh, surveys of supernovae. Why do you use supernovae? Supernovae are big stars that explode in a surprisingly universal matter, which means that essentially two supernovae of a certain type look very much the same. And so you can use observations of these supernovae to kind of gauge how distant an event was uh, in the universe because they're really standard candles, as astronomers call them. Okay, so these folks basically measured a bunch of supernovae and realized that the expansion of the universe look like this red line here. So this is how big the universe gets as a function of time, and uh, their task was to distinguish between these three curves, and they were good enough to say conclusively that it's not gonna be the big crunch, it's not gonna be the big rip, it's gonna be this boring constant dark energy that is gonna dominate the universe eventually. Okay, so their task was again to extrapolate between these two things. And uh, what dark energy does is it accelerates the expansion of the universe. So not only does the universe grow in size as we speak, it grows in size in an accelerated way, which means it's growing faster and faster, okay? It's not only just expanding, and expanding at a growing rate. Uh, so there are these two concurrent things that go on in the universe. This dark matter that weighs things down, and dark energy that is represented by these balloons uh, that pulls things apart, that causes this accelerated expansion in the universe, if that makes any sense. So my friend at the University of Chicago, Rocky Cobb, likes to say that you should not let the bright light <laughs> fool you. The dark side controls the universe. Dark matter holds it together, and dark energy determines its destiny. 
<laughs> so that's that's actually the case. That's what happens. So Sean Carroll at Caltech calls our universe a preposterous universe, a word that I had no idea what it meant because I'm Italian and ignorant. But I I, I looked up in the dictionary. It means kind of strange. Uh, so uh, let me get back to this pie, which is not the Nobel Prize pie. Uh, here we've got the budget of energy and matter in the universe and uh, the numbers are pretty striking so dark energy makes up for about 70 percent of the matter energy content of the universe dark matter makes up about 25 percent and then everything else and it's unknown to those of us who study dark matter and dark energy why funding agency don't distribute accordingly funding <laughs> which tends to go to these teeny details like heavy elements 0.03% why should you spend any money on that? I don't know <laughs> or you know stars 0.5% and we give so much money to astronomers I don't know why etc. <laughs> Chemistry just accounts for 4% so uh, I should tell the Dean perhaps uh, but anyways indeed this preposterous universe is uh, wider than our views of it, as Henry David Thoreau once famously said. It's wider than our views of it. It's really a weird, weird place. So let me tell you a little bit uh, more about dark energy and dark matter. What do we know about these two things, and what do we think these two things are? So dark energy, the big piece of the pie, 70%. It is clearly a big, open problem but it comes with a trivial solution and now I'm gonna use the power of equations to obliterate you and so here is the first equation that's called it's actually uh, 16 equations for the price of one it's called Einstein's equations and that's all there is to what we think gravity looks like uh, and then there's this term that Einstein wanted to put in its equations, his equations, uh, which is a negative pressure fluid. It's called the cosmological constant. So this is a great story because Einstein thought that the universe was static, that the universe was not moving, but his equations were telling him, no, the universe ought to be expanded. So Einstein introduced this cosmological constant to stop the expansion of the universe. Uh, but then Hubble came about and said, no, look, the, the universe is actually expanding, it turns out. And so Einstein was like, okay, well, we can just set the cosmological constant to zero and we're gonna stop the expansion of the universe. Uh, and so putting in the cosmological constant was his biggest mistake. But it turns out that, in fact, by inserting the right value to that cosmological constant, you exactly reproduce the effects of dark energy. Okay, you exactly reproduce the effects that we observe in the universe. So the cosmological constant can stop the expansion or can also trigger this accelerated expansion. And here's a picture of Einstein explaining these weird concepts. <laughs> the okay, so dark energy, dark energy is certainly worth about worth thinking about. Okay, maybe it's not as simple as the cosmological constant, but it must be said that there exists a very compelling, simple candidate called the cosmological constant that fits just about any observation we have about dark energy. So dark energy is the big guy, but it does have a very trivial solution. Okay, It's a big question that we think has a very simple solution. Now, if you ask the question, do we understand why the cosmological constant has that particular value? Well, the answer is no. We have no clue. But we also have no clue why the electron has that mass, or why the proton has that mass, or why the speed of light is the speed of light. Okay, there's a lot of constants that we just know nothing about, and in particular we know nothing about their origin and their numerical value. Perhaps the cosmological constant is yet one more constant that we don't have a good enough scientific model to predict, or to understand at a deeper level. Now let's talk about dark matter. So dark matter, if you look at the standard stuff, the stuff that gravitates like Newton told us, uh, well, dark matter really is a very important piece of 
the game because it's 85% of all of the matter in the universe. So if you take a galaxy like our Milky Way, where stars really are only 1% of the galaxy, most of the galaxy is made up of dark matter and then there's a little bit of gas around, okay, but really most of the thing that makes up uh, galaxies like our own is dark matter. So why is dark matter interesting and especially interesting to particle physicists? Well, primarily because there is no way to explain the dark matter with the particles we know and love. So dark matter is a very, very sharp evidence for new physics, for physics that goes beyond uh, what we know about particle physics. Okay, so let me tell you about a little bit about why we think the dark matter is qualitatively there, what is the circumstantial evidence for dark matter, and why we think we control, we understand these numbers that I'm, I'm giving throughout this talk. So why is this the quantitative picture? So qualitatively, we know dark matter has to be there for at least three reasons. We observe it directly in assemblies of galaxies called clusters of galaxies. There's direct observation of dark matter. Uh, we observe it in smaller things like galaxies like our own Milky Way. And we know that we need dark matter to form the beautiful pictures that we were looking at before, structure formation, the formation of uh, structure in the universe. So let me tell you a little bit about classes of galaxies. This is a beautiful application of Einstein's general relativity that says that even though in kindergarten we were taught that light propagates in straight lines, that's actually not quite true. So in fact, when you go to first grade, you learn that light is bent by matter. This is called gravitational lensing, right? Look. Everybody's going that. Is that second grade, maybe? And uh, so if you have a big cluster of galaxy and some source of light between you, uh, I'm sorry, behind the cluster of galaxies, so you're here observing, and there's a distant galaxy here, there's a cluster of galaxy. So the light from the distant galaxy is bent by the dark matter. And so you see, observe directly virtual images of galaxies. Uh, that are exactly copies of this distant gal galaxy and by studying these images and doing some hocus pocus that only astronomers do and know how to do correctly you can actually reconstruct how much matter there is here and you can actually prove that there is 85 percent dark matter in cluster of galaxies okay that is you know about five times more matter than the ordinary galaxies you observe in this process so it's, it's a very direct measurement. The other direct measurement comes from seeing how fast things go around galaxies like the Milky Way. Okay, so if you've ever tried to take a rock and tie a rock around, uh, and tie a string around the rock, and you spin it around you, as you spin faster and faster, there is a stronger force that you have to apply to keep the rock on rotation. Okay, the stronger force corresponds in a gravitational situation like a galaxy to more matter. Okay, so the faster things spin around, the more matter has to be there to keep them in orbit. Okay, so measuring how fast things go around galaxies tell us, tells us how much matter is within that galaxy. And that exercise has been carried out many, many, many times with a lot of galaxies and always we observe that there has to be a lot more matter than the stars we actually see. And that matter is dark matter. So that's kind of a qualitative argument. We can get a rough estimate of how much dark matter there is based on these arguments. But really the way we understand how much dark matter there is overall in the universe so the big quantitative cosmological picture comes from a budget problem. Okay? It's really a budget problem, which means uh, we count the total amount of matter and we measure how much matter of the order model of particle physics, which is a beautiful theory. It's a beautiful theory that explains essentially all of the observations we have 
of matter and interactions. It explains electromagnetism, strong interactions, nuclear interactions, it explains all of chemistry, it works very, very well. And all there is to the standard model are these particles here, the matter fermions, and these uh, force carriers, plus you might have heard this guy called the Higgs boson that plays a role in giving mass to all of the other particles. <laughs> so, some of these particles are unstable, which means in a billionth of a second they decay, they go away, so they're not good to be the dark matter that has to be around for about 10 billion years, so not good. Uh, and then dark matter suddenly does not interact strongly, which means it cannot be a quark. It cannot be something that uh, we would see ordinarily because it interacts so strongly. Also, it's dark, so it cannot be a photon up here. And it cannot be what we call a lepton, which are electrons, charged particles, and they're heavier copies. So what we're left are these real things. Looks like an, a, a V. It's actually a new, a Greek letter that indicates neutrinos. Neutrinos, maybe they're good. They're neutral particles. They interact weakly, but no, they're not good either because neutrinos are very, very light particles that move at the speed of light and they would not at all form structures in the way that we observe in Joel Primack's beautiful and body simulations. So, we are out of luck with the standard model. We have to come up with something else, with a new particle, which is great because we would really like to understand where the standard model came from and maybe the dark matter leads the way to uh, this beyond the standard model new physics that all the particle physicists are after. So what are the dark matter candidates? Well, of course, observational constraints are no match for the creativity of theorists. And so if you could read these little numbers, which my graduate student Adam has finished his beer back there, uh, cannot read. Uh, but it's 10 to the minus 33, and here it's 10 to the 18, so we've got more than 50 so-called orders of magnitude, more than 50 powers of 10 in mass. Another way to say we have no idea what the mass of the dark matter particle might be. And this is what we call cross-section, which means how strongly the dark matter particle might interact with us, with ordinary matter. And again, this is minus 39, this is 24, so that's more than 60 orders of magnitude, so we really, really don't have any idea of the interaction strength. Okay, we have some conjectures about regions of this plot where there might be dark matter particles that make sense. And in fact, we think that some class of candidates, so-called WIMPs, okay, Wimps, I know. So there's another class of candidates called machos, and <laughs> as an Italian I would much rather work on machos than wimps, but it turns out that machos don't work, and we're stuck with wimps. So unfortunately I have to work with wimps. Uh, so wimps are really very well motivated particle candidates. Why are they well motivated? Well, let me give you one argument. The one argument is that if you take a wimp, you put it in the early universe, and you ask the question, how many WIMPs should there be today? Well, the answer is exactly the same number as the observed amount of dark matter in the universe. This is the so-called WIMP miracle. Okay? And, uh, come tell me the scientists don't believe in miracles. We do believe in miracles. And one example is this WIMP miracle. WIMPs kind of automatically, because they're weakly interacting, they magically produce the right abundance uh, of dark matter today. So that's a pretty compelling argument for me to go after WIMPs because all of these other particles you have to kind of say okay magically they have the right abundance and uh, maybe a miracle is better than magic I don't know. But anyway WIMPs are definitely definitely very well motivated candidates. They arise in a lot of extensions of the standard model. You might have heard of supersymmetry for example, supergravity, string theory, all of these things contain WIMPs, okay, contain particles that could be the dark matter that uh, behave like WIMPs. So what do WIMPs do? Well, primarily they interact very weakly with particles in the standard model. For example, quarks here, okay, so this is a WIMP, this is another Greek letter called chi, represents a WIMP, 
And this is some interaction that, as I said, we have no idea of what it is. And this is our standard model. Uh, this is a class of diagrams that are called Feynman diagrams. We really like them in particle physics. And thanks to Mr. Feynman, who was at Caltech. Uh, so, if you look at the diagram in this direction, you've got two dark matter particles that turn into, say, two quarks. And then we can look for these two quarks, and this is called indirect detection. It's indirect because you're not detecting the dark matter, you're detecting the annihilation products, okay? The products of this disintegration of two dark matter particles. And then you can look at the diagram in this direction, you've got a dark matter particle which encounters a proton, for example, okay? A proton off the top of the head of the speaker and it bounces off of it, and in the final state you've got another dark matter particle and the same proton. So this is a scattering process, it's called in, in particle physics, and maybe if you're good enough to reduce all of the other things that could produce such an effect, you can directly detect the scattering of dark matter. This is called direct detection. And there's many, many super sophisticated experiments that look for this signal, and maybe they've seen one. And finally, if you take two particles, for example two protons, and you smash them together, you can hope to actually produce dark matter in a collider, okay, in a controlled environment. And so this is the collider detection of dark matter. And there's these big colliders, uh, one at Fermilab uh, near Chicago, the other one in Geneva in Switzerland, and uh, they're smashing protons and protons and protons and antiprotons and making a lot of things and hopefully maybe they will also make dark matter. So let me tell you a little bit about these colliders. This is an aerial view of uh, Switzerland and France. This is Lake Geneva and this is uh, this weird red thing that goes around and if you fly you see this red knot. Just kidding. It's <laughs> deep underground. It's 100 meters deep and it's uh, about 30 kilometers long so that's, that's a pretty long way, if you, even if you're a distance runner, it takes a while to run 30 kilometers. Uh, and there's these experiments looking for the products of collisions of protons with protons. Uh, they have not seen dark matter so far, uh, but they're stubborn and they keep trying. And they will keep trying even harder because right now we are at an energy of about 7,000 ti 7, times the rest energy of the proton, and they're going to go to 14,000 times. And actually, uh, UC Santa Cruz is leading uh, this effort of upgrading the energy of this collider, so we're, we're doing part of the job. Okay, then direct detection. Here, the idea is again that you have a dark matter particle that so arrives, gives a little kick to a nucleus of ordinary matter, and you want to detect that kick. Okay? It's a very complicated job because there's many things like neutrons uh, that come from radioactivity that can produce the same effect. And so you've got these very, very low background detectors that are designed uh, to uh, almost be background free and they look for these teeny energy depositions from cosmological dark matter. It's a very fascinating thing and there's about you know, tens and tens of experiments and some of them, some of them have seen, this is the same plot as before, the mass versus the interaction cross-section. Some of these experiments apparently have seen some signals. So it's a very exciting point in time. But these signals, as you can see, are in this region to the right of this black line. And it turns out that the meaning of the black line is that some other experiment has ruled out this region of parameter space. Okay, so certain experiments say, I've seen a signal, and these other experiments say, no, the region where you've seen a signal, my experiment should have seen a much bigger sigma, so it's ruled out. So it's a very confusing situation, but it is exciting because maybe there is a uh, signal there in direct detection. So now, indirect detection is instead the job of looking at the disintegration processes uh, that dark matter can produce. And so, here's an example of the many particles that you can have. You can have positrons, electrons, uh, antimatter, and in fact, what my graduate student there, Adam, is doing with me is using antimatter, 
which is rare enough that maybe we can disentangle the antimatter produced by dark matter in its annihilation processes. So there's experiments that measure that, and we are working on the theory side of that. Uh, you can have gamma rays, and in Santa Cruz we are uh, kind of leading the game of this gamma ray space telescope called Fermi. Uh, and, and again, you can detect gamma rays that come from dark matter annihilation. Uh, you can detect positrons and electrons, also with Fermi, and then you can detect X-ray and, and synchrotron light, etc., etc., and neutrinos, all these things. This is called indirect dark matter detection, and, uh, and again, the question is, can we use this information to learn about particle physics? Okay, and really, it's, uh, it's a very fascinating endeavor, and that's kind of the core of my research. So it turns out that life is never easy. Uh, it's really never easy, it turns out. And uh, the most exciting places to look for a signal are always the wars in terms of backgrounds. Okay, for example, the center of the galaxy, you expect a lot of dark matter to be there, so a lot of the signals should live there, but the center of the galaxy is also the place where there's the biggest mess of all in terms of astrophysical backgrounds. There's a lot of gas, many high energy astrophysical processes and so on. But we do have some signals from indirect detection that could be due to dark matter. For example, we observe there's way too many positrons, which are the so-called anti-electrons, we call them positrons, copies of the electron but with positive charge, so there's too many positrons in the cosmic radiation, and so maybe some of those are produced by dark matter. And then there's this bright signal from the center of the galaxy, which again is a very messy place, but we think to be convinced that there is an excess of gamma radiation from there. And then there's this weird little feature here, again from the center of the galaxy, that looks like a line in some sense or some way, and again, that could be due uh, to uh, dark matter annihilating uh, in the galaxy. So uh, I really would like to hear your questions. So I'm going to stop here, and I'm going to leave you with this picture. And with the notion that the cosmic puzzle is really far from being solved, the reason why I'm so excited is that, and, and what I try to convey here is that this is a really blank page of science books, okay? We know nothing about dark matter. This is a chapter that needs to be written. We need motivated folks to write this chapter of science. We know that dark matter is there. That's almost uh, a settled thing. Uh, it, there's very, very hard evidence for that. But we have no idea of what the dark matter is. And it's, again, a blank chapter in the big book of science that needs to be written. And it's very, very exciting uh, to at least be uh, part of those who try to write this uh, big new chapter. And I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> there is a question there. Um, don't think they are related. Um, we have dark energy, dark matter, and then there's black holes who also have some kind of darkness in them. Is there any relation? I mean, that's more in the astronomy yeah. part. Yeah, so the question is, do uh, black holes have anything to do with dark matter and dark energy? Uh, because they're pretty dark, it turns out. Uh, so uh, that's, that's a very valid point. So black holes are, in fact, or at least black holes of some form, are candidates for dark matter. So what happens is that if the black holes are too big, uh, they would disrupt beautiful things like our own galaxy. So imagine there's a bunch of black holes, massive things, that go up and down and move through the disk of the galaxy. What would happen is they would destroy and destabilize the disk and literally tear it apart. So we know that if it is black holes, they have to be teeny black holes. And these are actually things that might exist, uh, are called primordial black holes. Uh, the problem with primordial black holes is that we don't really have a good way to 
predict how many there should be from first principles. Uh, they might or might not be there. Uh, and uh, we know that there's very, very strong constraints, not only on their mass, but also on their properties. So for example, you don't want these things to start swallowing stars because we don't see stars being swallowed all that often. So there are some constraints, but in general, black holes are dark matter candidates. So they are uh, under the radar. And let me tell you just very briefly how we go about detecting them. We stare at stars and we look at whether stars get all of a sudden brighter and then dimmer again. That's called microlensing, and so that's the key way. If there's a black hole that passes in front of a star, you would see this brighter, dimmer, because you have a lensing effect. And so that's the way in which folks try to look for primordial black holes as dark matter candidates. There's a question there. Um, in that uh, three-dimensional scheme you had with all the dark energy or all around, where's the Milky Way in that? Are we close to the center, or do we observe kind of an asymmetric Oh, great question. So, uh, you know, I, I would say that we know we are not at the center of anything, unfortunately. <laughs> not even our own galaxy, not even our own uh, solar system. Uh, so in that big picture, that big picture was a slice that is a tiny fraction of the observable universe that had a big cluster of galaxies. Actually, let me go back to that picture because I really like it, so I'm going to put it in the background. Then I'm going to show a picture of my son. <laughs> so that's my son. So, right, you can imagine that in this picture, we are a peripheral small halo, just like maybe this one here, or that one there. So the larger halos maybe contain tens of galaxies like the Milky Way, like for example, this halo here would probably contain 10 Milky Ways. This big guy at the center would probably contain a thousand galaxies like ours. Okay, so um, so that's kind of the scale of the problem. Okay, so yeah, once again, I, I cannot use this laser pointer, otherwise the movie stops. But uh, again, we would be one of the little teeny specks here. And this guy, and then these would be groups of galaxies, and this would be clusters of galaxies, and another cluster of galaxies. So yeah, we, we tend to be pretty significant on cosmological scales, I guess is a takeaway message. All right, more questions? Yes? Do we know enough about WIMPs to differentiate interactions between them and neutrinos, say? Or? So the question is, do we know enough about WIMPs to differentiate them from other particles, like for example neutrinos? Yeah. Uh, yes, we do know quite a bit about WIMPs, uh, especially what they cannot be. So the type of interactions they certainly do not have. And from several uh, pieces of information, some come directly from particle physics experiments. Some come from things like this, from simulations of what the formation of structure would look like. For example, if uh, we had neutrinos be the dark matter, we would see very, very large objects that would fragment and so the picture would be one where you have these primordial clusters of galaxies and then uh, the smaller galaxies forming later. And that's actually exactly the opposite of what is observed. What is observed is that the most ancient galaxies are the smallest ones and then clusters, the big guys, are the youngest of there's any hope to detect dark matter via interactions with ordinary matter other than gravity then it's weak interactions. It's the interactions that cause radioactive decays, the interactions mediated by the uh, heavy intermediate mass gauge bosons. Okay, those are the only option that is open for the dark matter to interact with ordinary matter, so weak interactions. In fact, WIMPs 
stands for weakly interacting, as in weak interactions, massive particles. Okay. <laughs> I think you've earned your dinner, Stefano. Uh, if you have questions, please come talk to Stefano, and I'm going to formally conclude tonight's event. If, again, if you have not signed up for the Science on Tap mailing list and you want to be informed about our upcoming events, please see me. I have a nice tablet here, and you can give me your email address. And if you have any questions about Science on Tap or Women in Science and Engineering, please speak to me or one of the many other officers who are here tonight. So let's give a round of applause.